Hi, Betty. This is the Marley call for Monday, June 5th, 2023. Uh, let me turn on the transcript also just for grins. There we go. So transcript is on. Um, so we have a couple. Um, over the weekend, we sort of reconfigured some things to get uh, efficient on what this project sort of wants to be or needs to be. Uh, and I will explain these things as best I can. Uh, so it seems like the fastest uh, path to getting some results for where, where we were heading was to create a quick first book as quickly as we can. That's why it's called the quick first book. And our current candidate for the quick first book is uh, Klaus's, uh, basically Klaus is the champion of this idea called, temporarily called Food Revolt. It might end up with a different name. Uh, but it's very much about bioregionalism, about rethinking the food system, and about other kinds of issues. And we have some draft uh, writings on, on on the board. But uh, but I, I think what we're, we're what we're about to do is um, Stacy uh, really what well, we we named this call Marley in honor of Stacy's late dog, uh, who passed very recently, uh, and very dear dog. And that's worked really well, except Stacy has a, a bunch of ideas that she'd like to write about that aren't about the food revolt. And she would love to use the Marley name for that writing, which sounds totally great. So we're gonna stop calling this call and, and this, this piece of the project Marley. Uh, that will now be the name of Stacy's proto book uh, or whatever she wants to create with whoever wants to join her creating that. And I think, She's going to set up a Zoom call parallel to this one for anyone who wants to work with her on that. I'm, I'm not exactly sure, and I don't know that if whether she's going to show up on this call because we can get confirmation that way, but we'll we'll figure all that out um, afterward. Uh, so um, so for this project, I think I think the timing is, and totally open to other other um, proposals. Uh, I think the timing is let's just dive really let's. Let me but step back. Originally, this whole project was to create a neo book or several neo books, and I'll explain what a neo book is in a second. And I actually need to make more recordings about what a neo book, in fact, actually is. Uh, then the quick first book was going to be the proto neo book, the very first one, and that was going to spin out and create a small sequence of calls to go do that writing. Instead of that, I think what we're going to do right now is just repurpose this call to be that team and to focus exclusively on creating a draft of something that looks like a neo book around the topic of food revolt. Then we'll come back and sort of bounce back into the uh, neo book production mode. And uh, at that point, I think Pete Kaminsky and others who are more technical than us uh, will rejoin us. And at that point, we will start to figure out, okay, good. So we can publish a, we publish food revolt as uh, a neo book, as an EPUB and maybe Kindle file format book. And we've done that. Uh, there's also, and, and in a second, I'll explain what neobooks are. But there's also some some kind of more, more to me more interesting work to do on the written materials as they exist on the web. So um, in this neobook project, kind of a, a book has been a, um, a shiny object that is culturally familiar to other people. So we can say, hey, look, we wrote a book, but the book is a gateway. Uh, to actually joining us online in active conversations about the materials that are in the book and making the, those materials better, uh, and then maybe repurposing or reusing some of the materials in each of the books in other books. So if there's a book that needs a, an explanation of soil fertility, for example, and if there's a really good one that published in the quick first book, then book num neo book number three might in fact reuse that chunk of text or full chapter about soil fertility, for example. And that's the idea is that uh, the neo book is actually composed of nuggets or modules that are kind of independent and reusable um, in different ways. And it's easy to envision, or at least I can easily envision several different neo books that have very different thesis, theses or conclusions that reuse the same modules. So for example, there's a, an interesting debate between Alan Savory and uh, grazing cattle is really important to regenerative uh, grasslands and all of that. And other people saying, no, 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 cows create the most methane, then we should get rid of the big herds of cows altogether. Uh, and I, I am certainly no expert in doing that, but I can easily see two books that have similar but, but contrasting points of view about that particular topic existing down the road. 
And I don't think that the quick first book right now, Klaus, as you envision it, uh, cares one way or the other about that particular issue, although it might. Um, so uh, if that if does that make sense, I'll stop right there for for uh, any questions or thoughts or comments, and then I'll go. I will go a little deeper and try to explain the neo book concept uh, a little bit in a little more depth. But let me let me pause here. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> there being no questions and some thumbs up, I will proceed to a little more detail on the neo book. Um, well, before you yeah. do that, Jerry, I just Please, Barry. the reason I came on today is I thought possibly Stacy was going to be here, and I was confused about the split up. But I only came on because I thought maybe people wanted to find out who is this guy that they never heard of, who's on the OGM, and that's why I showed up. But I'm not actually going to be in this book project, and I just no point in me staying on unless you think somebody else is going to come on. And who, I, I do know not who the hell I am. And I do not know whether Stacy will be on this call. I suspect not. And I don't know if anyone else is going to show up, but it would be lovely if you just talked about yourself for a little bit as by way of introduction. And I think that'd be a fantastic thing. Okay. So and, I know Stacy. And Stace Barry, yes. and Barry also, also, it's not that uh, everybody who's on this call, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's not that everybody on this call has to be either an author or has to participate in the book. I think the idea is how do we... How do we plan and get uh, this new kind of a project going? And so we may, maybe you and I are not going to be authors. Doesn't really matter. So if, yeah. if it interests you, please stay on. You know, so introduce yourself, stay on, have fun as long as you can, and then pop up, uh, pop out whenever you feel like. Okay, um, Stacy had sent me um, a Zoom call at two o'clock, but I can't. I don't know if it's for today or tomorrow. Maybe it's <laughs> for tomorrow. Anyhow, I know Stacy. From from Facebook, and and the uh, um, GCC. Does anybody not know what GCC stands for? It's it's a okay. It's global. See if I can even remember how to parse it. Global collaboration community or something like that. How about global challenges collaboration started that, in 2017. Thank you. So Sam Han and some other people who were no longer in that project a few years ago started this this global challenges collaboration and Stacy was on it. Uh, and it's mostly people on Facebook and she invited me in, I don't know, three years ago or something. That's how I got to know Stacy. And she wanted me to meet people like uh, Heiner Banking who's a systems thinker like I am. And so somehow or other, I got involved with Stacy mostly on the Facebook OGM side, not OGM side, the GCC side and partly came over here because I was invited to come here for the Thursday call, but then I had a conflict because the Toastmasters meeting turned out to conflict with it. And I I got dragooned into being the techie guy for them, so they, I need to be there. So anyhow, Stacy ha has lots of inchoate creative ideas that she's been tossing around, and she pulled me and other people into kind of processing these uh, and actually, as far as I know, no actual product has ever emerged, except she pulled me in because she knew that I occasionally will write song parodies about whatever the zeitgeist is in the air. So the last time she called me in, I gleaned just enough of the zeitgeist to write, I don't know, five or six original song parodies and reprise a few others. And I put those up on my website, thinking that that was going to be my creative contribution and nothing else as far as I know ever emerged. And uh, more recently, Stacy has disclosed something that kind of surprised me. She says, it's not important that we actually have a product. It's just having fun tossing it around is what she's in, in it for. And I thought, well, okay, that I, I get that the, it's not the destination, it's the journey. And the destination is you just turn around and go back home again. But I wanted to, to sort of reveal where I am. And I don't mind kicking around ideas just for fun and maybe produce you know, a little snippet of amusing material. Uh, but I'm not into writing a book. <laughs> I've got my own research that I've been publishing since, you know, since before my retirement. And I only came on because I somehow got involved in this interchange between these two groups that Stacy is half in OGM and half in GCC. And because my name popped up, uh, I was summoned into OGM 
text, I thought I should show up and just let people know who I am. I will add that Barry and I know each other from way back as well. Uh, we served time together in Sing Sing and have matching tattoos. Um, <laughs> and Barry has uh, attended a retreat or two of, of the retreats that I used to host back in the day. So, right. so Barry and I have, have, uh, go, go back a ways as well. Uh, so it was actually really fun to see that that you and Stacy had connected, and that that was a way of that, that we were kind of coming back into uh, into conversation, which I really appreciate. Yeah, that's right. So if if at any time, Jerry, you have an activity that really does overlap with my depth, so um, why don't you tell everybody what you like? If if somebody waved a magic wand and made the whole world like uh, align with what you're trying to get done, what would we all be doing? Okay, so. The last piece of deep research that I did in my career um, after they broke up the bell system where I had been doing network planning just to earn a living, um, I began to think about the interplay of emotions and learning. And I developed what amounts to a mathematical model of the interplay of emotions and learning. I began doing that in 1985. After about 15 years of kicking it around, uh, a colleague of mine who was a public school teacher who had just completed his EDD to advance his career told me that he wanted to learn how to write grants. And he was looking for ideas to write a grant, but he said, you never get your first grant, it's just for practice. So I gave him a bunch of ideas and he says, oh, let's go with this emotions and learning theory. Um, it's, it'll never, it's so far over the horizon, it'll never get funded, but it's a good exercise for your first try. And I, um, brought in a, a professor at, at the MIT Media Lab who had just created a discipline called affective computing. And she agreed to sign on. So we wrote the grant and I say, we, I didn't write a word of the grant. <laughs> they wrote, you know, the public school teacher wrote the first draft and then my friend, the professor sort of cleaned it up. We submitted it and lo and behold, it got funded. So starting wow. around 2000 for about eight years, cause we got, a, 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 a renewal of the grant halfway through it. Uh, we worked on this project of the interplay of emotions and learning and how technology might play into um, facilitating that. The very first peer reviewed paper that we wrote after we got funded, I went to a conference in Madison, Wisconsin to deliver the paper. It was just the theory, just the model. And on the third night, which was the dinner, I was sitting next to a lovely young lady I'd met there and we were chatting amiably over dessert when she stopped me and she said, Barry, shut up a second. I said, what? Uh, she said, they just called your name. You just won the best theory paper award. Get your ass up there. <laughs> so that, you know, that was the launch of this emotions and learning uh, theory. And actually, Jerry, when I went to your very first retreat, I imagined that I would have a chance to present it. Never happened. <laughs> there were so many people there who had so many things to say. And this was a, like a 20 minute in-depth um, scholarly presentation. So I actually never presented it to any people at your retreats. They might have found out about it, you know, elsewhere. But anyway, that's that that was my connection. Jerry was aware of my work in online learning communities in the 90s. And he had written about it in, uh, what was it called, 1.0? Release 1.0. Yeah, he had written a little bit about it in Release 1.0. And that's why he invited me to the retreat, because I was a pioneer in the 90s of recruiting computers and the internet to improve public school education in the STEM discipline, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And it was in that context that I was also exploring how to make learning fun, that is get the emotional part of it, not dull and boring like it is for most kids, but, but engaging and fun. And so you'd get a lot of good learning, but also it was pleasurable. And I think I've said enough. <laughs> um, love that, Barry. And I, I was just going through your entry in my brain, which is here. I've been adding a couple of things to it. And I realized that uh, this was a Google site that apparently is no longer. Uh... Yes, I went to your site to see if I had the ability to change that. The Google, the first version of Google Sites, yeah, uh, they changed it to a new version, right? And just just like a week or two, well, a month ago, they ported my site over and automatically converted it. Now, if do you, I have? Let me see if, if you I have the it. new link, I will add it right this minute. 
I believe I do. You we could do real time this. editing to the gr just global brain. Just give me a brain. second to find where I've got it here. Because I just Googled for it and did not. I, I was not able yeah. to find a new link for right. it. So here it here it is. And I'm I'm a Google Sites fan, so I'm I understand yeah. what you mean. So I copy that. I go back to come to the Zoom and hit the chat. Yeah, hit the chat. So it's it's pretty much the same material, except it's they changed the URL. So this is the new Google Sites. Um, and the name is a little weird now, but um, cool. That's so right. that's that's the new it, that's the new version of it. And by oh. the way, on the sidebar, you'll see everything else is on Google Sites besides that. <laughs> yeah, which if, exactly. anything, which if anything intrigues you, feel free to you know suck it down. So here's the old URL, and I'm going to paste in now. Wait, oh, that's weird. I'm pasting. Oh, that's interesting. Edit location, paste. There we go. Here's the new URL. So now this should go back to the same site. And uh, but -da -ba -da, we're and there it we're is up, up so, and running. So that's pretty much the same content, except it's kind of a little bit reformatted, not as cleanly. And and the table of contents is I guess got to be redone because they mm -hmm. didn't do that right. Cool. And then on the sidebar is everything else I've put on Google Sites. Sweet. So uh, everybody had the link because it's in the chat. Yeah, sounds and that's great. It. And that's it for me. Go ahead. Yeah, if I may say, I mean, I think this is uh, uh, actually incredibly relevant to what we're talking about here. Um, maybe if I can just place in a nutshell what we have written so far, you know, in 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 this book. I mean, it's basically making the point that um, from a historic perspective, evolutionary perspective. Um, any civilization that lost control over its way of producing food has has vanished. Yeah, um, and in many cases, it was because the irrigation systems weren't properly laid out. The soil started to salinate. Um, water, uh, 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 the the soil became uh, lost its carbon content. You know, dried out, and so on and so on. So. <clears throat> Conversely, you have cultures around the world who have lived on their same land for thousands of years without destroying their soil. I mean, think of Japan, Vietnam, you now think of the European countries and so on. So these cultures have developed a, a way to, to make themselves sustainable, to, to, to continue sustainably on their, on their particular land. And the way that came about is uh, what I refer to as bioregions. So when you take Europe, for example, you look at the distinctly different cuisines from France, Italy, Spain, Germany, you know, the British islands. <clears throat> and they all have found ways to, to grow a regimen of crops with integrated animal, uh, called with uh, in integrated animal husbandry that maintains the fertility of their soil. So the, 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 they're going through the season, they're rotating their crops, you know, they're building, in, uh, one crop takes nutrients out, the other one puts nutrients in, and so on and so on. And they developed recipes and dietary patterns uh, that are, first of all, seasonal, and then secondly, also always within the content of what uh, of what their land can produce in, in the right volumes and sustainably and keeps the population healthy. So with the, with the advent of the settled, the, the new world countries, you know, America, Canada, I mean, US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and so on, you had cultures from all over the world converge you know, on, on uh, on the United States with a complete lack of comprehension of what made them successful from where they came from, right? So they took snippets out of it. And then came this obsession of the, you know, uh, uh, US culture of innovation and doing stuff that hasn't been right before and so on. So they discovered that you could make uh, synthetic nitrogen, you know, with fossil fuels and uh, actually, you know, out of World War II came <clears throat> came that, that started uh, as a as a weapon, right? But then uh, 
uh, someone discovered that you put some of that nitrogen onto the soil and poof, everything just starts now going wild. So, so the the um, so the 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 application of synthetic nitrogen then became uh, a facilitated monocrop practices. You know, huge fields, and uh, you just put nitrogen on it, and everything booms. But then you now you have to protect against predation from insects and weeds. So you started uh, herbicides and, and insecticides made from oil. Now, so we have basically a fossil fuel based food system now. And that has systematically killed off the soil microbiome. So we have in the US millions of acres, 40% of the US topsoil is degraded. You know? um, and can't produce food without the application of synthetic fertilizers and mined minerals and so on and so on. But in the, in the process, several things have happened. One is that soil um, that is depleted of carbon and micronutrients cannot absorb water anymore. For every 1% of, of, uh, of soil organic carbon, the soil can hold 20,000 gallons per acre. So when you have healthy soil that holds between, let's say, 4 and 10% of uh, organic carbon, you have massive volumes of water that are being carried inside the soil, which then which absorbs rainfall you know, like a sponge and then releases it slowly into the streams and into the aquifers. It also supports what is called the small water cycle. So there, there is there, there is a hydrological exchange from from moist soil, you know, that evaporates. It's called trans transvaporation, and then rains back down. So sixty percent of local rain is actually caused by this uh, 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 transvaporation. There, sorry, I'm not a scientist, <laughs> but. Um, and, and so with having millions of acres of soil dried out, that rain cycle has been severely disrupted, which then results in prolonged periods of drought, followed by massive uh, precipitations that are coming in. So what we see is this, 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 these disruptive climate cycles are, uh, to a very large degree, related back to the soil. You know? and, and on top of it, um, mm -hmm the nutrient content and quality of, uh, uh, of food of crops coming out of depleted soil is severely uh, 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 damaged. So when you eat an apple today, for example, and compare the nutrient content of an apple 50 years ago, uh, it's like a 20 fold factor, it's incredible. Uh, and so that happens throughout the entire food. So today, um, some, Two thirds of the U.S. population have a have a nutrition cost uh, a disease, um, diabetes, obesity, you know, heart disease, cancers, and so on and so on, because there is a the transfer of chemicals into the food supply. Um, a lot of them are neurotoxins. The uh, uh, lack of nutrition uh, that uh, you know comes with nutrient deficient food, so on, is causing enormous health problems. Some seventy percent. Of the U.S. healthcare bill are attributable to a, a nutrient deficient diet. So, so that's that's one part. But the the, the other part, then, of course, is that some fifty percent of U.S. watersheds are polluted because of of runoffs, chemical runoffs from the agricultural fields. So, fifty percent of U.S. watersheds are unfit for uh, recreation or fishing. You know, they're just simply too polluted, and then you know, so 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 all these these you know, pathologies coming together. Also, the the, the soil has lost some uh, about twenty five percent of the of the CO two that you now see in the in the atmosphere actually comes from carbon released out of the soils, because when the soil microbiome dies you know, with with the uh, chemical applications, it releases the carbon that's inside the soil. So, so there is a there is a recognition now that um, agriculture, our food system, will contribute somewhere between 0.7 and 0.9 degrees Celsius 
to global warming if it is not being addressed. And since we're already at 1.1%, it will crash us you know, beyond the 2% range and basically you know, contribute massively to, uh, uh, to, to the uh, climate change. Yeah, yeah to, uh, Jerry. Uh, a, a question. Um, you, at the start of what you were just saying right now, you said that what Barry had mentioned about affective computing and, and emotions and all that uh, connected in to what you were saying, but I haven't heard you say anything about affect or emotions right now. And yeah, I'm, wonder I'm wondering what that connection was because I don't, I don't feel like you're working toward making that point. So, so yeah, okay, let me make the curve now. <laughs> um, so in order to change food, right, in order to get people to eat something uh, that is uh, that is uh, culturally uh, uh, a culture change. Um, it is it is deeply uh, emotional. Um, you know the the our experience, and I'm working with the Sierra Club and, and and a bunch of NGOs. Our experience has been, I mean, even Meatless Monday, you know, is causing shockwaves uh, where where you have you know massive pushback. You Not know, just to tell to say, you know, why don't we have one day and, and or why don't we eat one burger less per week and so on. So, and, and, and I had to make one more loop to connect, uh, to connect to that point here. In order for the farmer to change into regenerative practices, they have to change the types of crops they're growing. They have to change out the types of seeds they're using. Because, and this is where we come to the bioregion point. You know, so the, the 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 type of soil, the condition of the soil, the local climate, even microclimates, access to water, and then the socioeconomics around it determine what the farmer can and should grow to regenerate that soil back to health. Um, on top of it, you have to use cover crops, for example, because there should always be a living wood in the ground, and you have to rotate crops which is not current practice because right now we have monocrop practices. Farmers are putting corn into the, so into the soil year after year and feeding it with chemicals. So to change all that implies that the entire supply chain behind it has to change because if you're asking the farmer to change their types of crops, you need to have a market for that to sell into. So that implies a significant Shift you know, in menus, in recipes. Uh, think about you know, McDonald's with 34,000 restaurants all having the same menu, wanting the same potato, the same French fry. Um, so, so how do you now engage the population to have an emotional connection you know, to, to the land, the, 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 the pain we have caused to the soil? Um, and, 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 and absorb that in ways that creates uh, a, a willingness, a preparation to participate. So that's where I'm coming in with the affection because it's super emotional you know, to change somebody's menus. Uh, Patty, please go ahead. Uh, Stacy, welcome. Glad you're on the call. Barry came to visit in order to show like who this Barry guy is, who's been chatting <laughs> online and stuff like that. So we he uh, he told us a lot about his activities a little um, a moment ago. Cool. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, thank you, Barry and Klaus. Um, Barry, it's really fantastic to meet you. Sunil, also great to be in space with you. Um, I, I Barry, I really appreciated your your sharing. I'm really happy to know more about your background and the the subject of your research. I am super um, super interested in what you were sharing around. Um, I don't remember how you stated it. Maybe you can remind me. You had said um, you were equating or creating a mathematical equation to reflect emotional experience. That's my language. Is that does that sound close? Yeah. If you if very simply, if you think of a learning curve, people always draw learning curves kind of like this. They rise steeply and they level off. And that in mathematics is monotonically always increasing, never decreasing, but people do not learn monotonically. They get incorrect information up here, which they eventually realize is baloney, and then they discard it. So the learning curve really has wiggles in it. Yeah. And it's the wiggles. I said, the curvature of a learning curve, the wiggles, what the hell is that? It turns out, and it takes a little while to figure this out, the, the wiggles encode emotional states. That's the key idea. That if you say, 
you have a certain amount of knowledge, it's increasing. So it's, you have learning, you have unlearning, discarding misconceptions, but you have this with these wiggles, concave down con, and convex up. And the question is, how does, that, how does that show up? How do we experience the wiggles? And the answer is, it shows up as affective emotional states, curiosity, fascination, puzzlement, confusion, disappointment, despair, hope, all of those emotional states that are associated with learning are encoded in the, in the wiggles, the ups and downs. That was the whole, that was the whole concept. And then I just wanted to write it down with some mathematical rigor, but also the narrative that you can use the street names for the uh, second. So an AI that's learning can also have incorrect information. You can reveal to it that you've it said two things that are mutually contradictory. And it says, oh my goodness, I, I made a mistake. And it has to discard the misconception. And I, I said to the AI, would you say, oh gee, my second derivative just went negative? Would you say that to a person? I said, oh, I would never say that. Well, what words would you use? Well, it says I'd use the same street language that ordinary people use when they're disappointed um, or surprised or astonished because something happened other than what they were expecting. That's yeah. the whole, that's in a nutshell, that's the whole story. <laughs> the math that's, is deeper than that, but that's the story. Patty, do you mind yeah. if I take Barry on a Please? short tangent? Please. Um, Barry, did you meet uh, Nicole Lazaro through retreats and stuff like that? I mean, have you looked at her games and emotion model, which I just was just trying to look for in my brain, but couldn't well, find, I can find it well, online. We're talking about or... 20 years ago, Jerry, and I don't, I certainly don't remember having met anybody by that name. Uh, She's a game developer in Berkeley, in Oakland, actually. And um, very briefly, um, it's and it's I think it's relevant and interesting and might actually inform your model. Uh, she talks about how game design is this delicate balance between uh, things that are too challenging and people fall off because like, crap, I can't solve this, but they have to be very challenging. So you have to right. walk that fine line and then uh, moments of satisfaction and achievement. And, and sort of game design is this bouncing back and forth between those things and games and learning are very intertwined in lots of interesting ways. Uh, it might be in, in Nicole's TED talk, uh, it's possible, uh, but that was a big piece of her, um, also her sort of consulting work for other game developers. Uh, she would use that model really often. Yeah, yeah, I would bring little, puzzle toys, this is a very simple one, but I would bring puzzle toys to the science museum and set up a puzzle activity from very simple puzzles for very young children to really sophisticated ones. And the and that's the idea, Jerry, you pick up a puzzle, it's the right level of challenge just for that person that week. And you, you sort of narrate them going through the, uh, this is fascinating, but then they get stuck because it's hard. And the idea was to be a whisperer to coach them to solve it without giving away the answer. And if you do it just right, they get a huge endorphin rush when they have the aha moment, when they have the breakthrough. And once you have that great endorphin high, that warm fuzzy, you go, that was great. I want to do that again. It has to be a new puzzle. It has to be a different challenge. So I would sort of get people to go through this cycle of emotions and learning with increasingly uh, more difficult challenges until they basically depleted their neuropeptides for the day. And they would come back, you know, a month later and say, Barry, let's have some more puzzles. <laughs> hmm. I, oh, uh, Jerry, you're muted. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, that tension. Back to you in the booth, Patty. Yeah, thank you. Um, Barry, I as an aside, I would be interested to um, hear more about this, perhaps just in a one-on-one -on -one conversation at some point. I think that's really fascinating what you've been working on. Yeah. Um, and I, uh, Klaus, I really enjoyed your, um, that was 10 minutes, maybe beautifully, um, summarized and, uh, spoken to the, um, the larger arc of, um, the implications of what we're facing with, uh, um, the food crisis. And I just thought that was really beautifully said. I really appreciate you summarizing in that way. And I really enjoyed you highlighting and underlining why the emotional, how how the emotional experience of whatever shift we are trying to make is is incredibly, um, it's important. And, and I think it would be unwise to ignore that and to um, not consider um, addressing that in some way. And um, I think I had another point as as an aside, I think it's, it's a larger question to the project actually. So Jerry, when you opened up the space for questions earlier, this would fall on that, I think. Um, I, I guess I'm still curious, maybe, and forgive me if this has been discussed and I just wasn't present for it. Um, has it been, have we talked about who we are trying to reach 
with these neo books. What um, I'm thinking generations, I'm thinking, um, yeah, target target audience. Has that been discussed? So we have um, had a very brief conversation about that, but we haven't really gone down into it in any depth. And there's a difference between a particular book like Food Revolt uh, and whose audience that would be and mm -hmm. who neo books are for. And neo books for me broadly are for anybody who's like interested in thinking or or you know manifesting what they've discovered. So it's really broad. But but an important piece of, of determining the tone and content of, of like uh, Food Revolt would be like, who do we want to influence by writing this? Yeah, the um, cool. something, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. So one um, discussion we have had uh, around, uh, um, around a target audience is that uh, in, in all these discussions you know, that you have on LinkedIn and within the NGOs and so on, there is a lack of vision to where are we actually going? You know, what is this going to look like? And um, there are you know, those of us who understand this is going to be significant. It has to be significant, right? Because we are in a situation now um, where the planetary systems have deteriorated to the point of moving towards tipping points that are really dangerous, right? And so, the, the shift has to be fairly fast. And typically, when you look at, at how tipping points are reached, it's like not much is happening. And then all of a sudden, everything is happening all at once, right? This is like the fall of the Berlin Wall. You know, it was perceived in, in, impossible to happen until it happened. And then all of a sudden, it happened like all at once. And I think what will, what will here be the case also is that um, the, the environmental uh, uh, changes are happening at an exponential pace. So we could see uh, and last year was, was phenomenal destructive. Um, I mean, it's incredible that when, when you see the Yangtze River drying out, you see one third of Pakistan underwater, Euro the European countries having major droughts and water crisis, Spain, which is the California of Europe, right up, right? So there are significant disruptions already on the way and it could get worse this year. And so there will be a point where all of a sudden, you know, we're moving, but then where are we going to? And so you, on the one hand, you have co corporate visions, you know, of doing lab corn meats and uh, fermentation of, uh, you know, protein, uh, plant-based protein, I mean, insane ideas, you know, or carbon capture, mechanical carbon capture and so on. And so there is no clear vision. Where are we going, right? What would this next state look like? So we had discussed building a destination and this came from Doug's Garden World. You know, let's define what the destination looks like. And then as a next step, we'll create a pathway from here to there. So the first thing is let's 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 define a destination that's practical, believable, uh, you know, something you can actually relate relatable. You now and then we can talk about how do we get from point A to point B. Thanks, Klaus. Um, I'm I'm been curious about how and if if we're concerned about speed of impact and speed of um, just growing awareness around the idea. I'm I'm curious if we might have. Um, when when the time is right and when we have enough that A to B that you're mentioning, Klaus, really well defined and really um, really clear, inviting in a younger younger generation. So I'm thinking, you know, we just had a cohort of um, you know college students. I live two blocks away from uh, Colorado College, and you know I know they have an environmental science program. I don't know. This is me speaking to a world I don't know much about. I'm speaking from ignorance here, but I'm wondering if we'd have luck tapping into grad programs, um, areas where there are students who are in this work and really wanting to make a difference and ready to do the work to help build up a movement, we tap into those places. We start there. I think um, my niece, Jerry, nice. Um, you know, and this is also a generation that's on social media. I think if we had um, if we had a story that was compelling enough and had enough meaning and was more, um, uh, um, I don't even know how to phrase this or to, to to name this idea, but it made more sense to carry this new story than the old story. There's something about this new story that we're creating that was more beneficial to the story holder than the current stories we're hearing around climate change. I don't know what that looks like. I think 
my guess is that having taking shame out of the equation is going to be important. I don't know how to do that, but I think that um, those are all areas that I'm inclined to think we would be um, be might be juicy to explore at the right time. And I don't know when that will be. And Klaus, I think you named it well. Having the well-defined A and B will be the, important. The target audience in my mind is what is what I call the Greater Thunberg generation. Mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is which is this discussion between Monbiot and Savory is so tragic, right? Because Monbiot has gotten to Greta Thunberg convincing her of veganism and rewilding and all this nonsense, you know, which has no practical application in the way that the world actually works. And so um, they, so, so the Greta Thunberg generation has no clear vision, you know, uh, what this destination looks like and how it how it really works. They have, you know, the idea of putting you know, we're, we're putting nature back together the way it was. Well, you can't, right? You have cross species. I mean, we have species tra transferred from one place to another. Plants and animals and insects and everything. You can never go back to what was one time ago. You know, so you have to move forward. So you have to envision a new reality. And we will have to be real stewards this time, you know, because we have to manage nature back to health. That is a new reality uh, you know, uh, for our species, really, on a planetary scale. So we need to create this vision and then instill love and passion to soil, right? Because soil is the essence of life, biodiversity, everything comes out of the soil. You know? And, and, and so, so that, that's one, one important part you know, to, to bring clarity to this vision uh, and, and, and find agreement within science also you know, to, yes, you know, here, here, here is where we are. And that is where we are. Um... Cool. I, let me just uh, pause for a second and see if anyone has any questions or thoughts about where we are. Uh, uh, Stacy, at the at the top of the call, I was explaining that we're sort of rearranging um, how how the different projects are working and focusing these calls on getting to the quick first book as quickly as we can. So so for the next couple of Mondays, this particular call will become kind of a co-writing uh, workshop. With anybody who feels like joining, uh, with sort of Klaus, I, I have a feeling sort of Klaus and me uh, in the middle, uh, trying to sort out what you know what fits where. Um, I like very much the idea that we just talked about about the intersection of Doug's Garden World vision and this, and I'm thinking that's like a quick second book or something like that. That that quick first book is its own standalone thing, and then we look around and go, oh, okay, good. We can you know let's see which parts of Garden World politics Doug's book actually fit or something else. I I don't know exactly where that goes, uh, and it 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 only goes anywhere if we find a champion for a particular point of view or a particular uh, book-like thing uh, to stand up and take off. Um, but that's kind of where we are. So let me let me step back from the conversation and see if anybody has thoughts, comments, anything? So I have uh, two points. Uh, okay, go ahead, Stacey. I was just going to say real quick that tomorrow, Barry and I are going to be meeting with two people that I met, a woman who is in, she's a medical biller right now. And she uses computers and she's going to learn how to use the AI with her son who created artwork. And I have a short video that I'll show at another time. I actually, Jerry, I gave it to you in the email yesterday. If you could put that in the chat, it's Barry explaining what he did with the painting from the little boy that I gave to him. I don't remember seeing a link to a video yesterday from you. Um, when you emailed me that we were going to split the calls, I said right. that I wanted to share that one. Gotcha. I will... Just to briefly explain, Stacy had this a drawing made by a nine-year-old boy. Painting. I, sorry? Painting. It was painting. Not a drawing. Painting. Okay, a painting. And I put it into the... Um, image scene analysis of chat GPT, the plugin. And I got it back a prose description. And then I asked for a poem and a fairy tale based on it. And that knocked Stacy's socks off. So yeah, it's watched. beautiful. <laughs> I found it, I found the link and I just pasted it into the chat. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, I thought Pete would have liked that idea too, because he was into making those quick books with the AI. And that was a way that I thought was really valuable, which we discussed on GCC. But I'm gonna have, I'll have yeah, a separate- I'm going to Google Drive. Sorry. Oh, that's you in the background. So yeah, yeah. Somebody, somebody yeah. clicking on the link without muting here. Yeah, so um, I'll explain what where the Marley Project is gonna go with that on another call. Sounds great. And anybody who wants to join that, join Stacy and Barry tomorrow. Um, what time, Stacy? If in case well, anybody not wants not tomorrow, not tomorrow. Tomorrow okay. we're just going to meet with the team that's going to actually get trained on this, you know, on how to do oh, it. Okay. It's going to be small, but I'll record it and share. Gotcha. Cool. Awesome. So um, I'm getting a little getting a little sleepy here in uh, yes. India. It's almost midnight. <clears throat> But uh, before I run, I thought I'd just uh, give my two cents. A um, couple of things. I'm just now, um, I'm not looking at the content so much. I'm just looking at the mechanics of executing on a book like this. I think it's a great idea. New, new books is absolutely a great idea, especially for the way you explained, Jerry, that uh, how it's going to leverage technology and cross-pollinate and stuff like that. I think that's a very powerful idea. Now, one of the things that comes to my mind is that if, uh, see, Klaus knows this, this domain like the back of his hand. And he knows it so well and he's so emotionally attached and so passionate about it that, I mean, you just ask Klaus to speak and he'll go on for the next maybe uh, three or four days, right? <laughs> so I think what, what Klaus should, Klaus, I, I would, I think I wrote this to you on the email as well. I'd like to share with the, the group that, you know, I'm part of a project. I got invited to write a piece and I realized that these guys were doing a multi-author book. So, which was very fascinating because you can div divvy up the work as much as you want. The thing is, how do you pick the right people to write? And what are the topics that you need to cover in the book? And somebody or one or two people, and maybe Klaus is the right person for this, he could uh, himself write the write a chapter, maybe write the conclusion or the introduction because he does a great job introducing it and have multiple people write it. So that way, my suggestion would be that we could actually cover the entire world. I threw a few names at Klaus as well so that the heavy lifting can be distributed to, amongst various people, right? And that lends a, a tremendous amount of credibility. It gives you the kind of coverage that you would like in the areas that you're talking about and then those networks can then uh, you know proliferate in the on their own way it's kind of like the network network effect so that's one suggestion and i can share you know what i've been doing and how we we've, we've been going about that the book is almost completed and makes a lot of sense the other thing i just wanted to bring uh, on the table was that you know there's a tendency that we get pulled into projects like these and then we uh, can't really pull back and see the the larger picture and I think these kind of, see, the book itself is not going to solve any problems at all, right? If we expected to do that, we'd be putting in too much effort, and then uh, we're going to be facing a lot of disappointment at the end, because we think we've done the job, and now the book will do its own job, which it really won't, right? Because then you you really got to put in money and market it and all that stuff. And then you're going to get distracted from the main purpose, which Klaus talked about is how do we guide the new generation? How do we assist them so that they get empowered by something like this? So I think if we can keep pulling ourselves back and saying the book is just one of those pieces that's a lead into a very massive movement so that the book then becomes a piece where people can come and interact with us, which is what I think will be beautiful from a new book perspective, right? Because new book, the technology can actually allow them to interact back with the book and take from the book, lead you into whichever, whichever place you want. That that was about it. And I, I think on that note, I, I'm going to wish myself sweet dreams and I'll catch up on the recording. That sounds really wonderful, Sunil. Thank you for that. Thank you for joining us here when it's so late where you are. Um, no, no, my, my pleasure. I mean, I wouldn't uh, miss an opportunity. And Klaus actually sent me a note in the morning and I said, no, I must keep my eyes open and ears open. Thank you. Excellent. Good night. Thanks, Sunil. Have a good day, guys. Yeah, bye. Bye, Sunil. Thank you. Have a good sleep. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Patty. Thanks, Barry. Thanks, Stacey. Um, other thoughts, comments about where we are? I think I, I would um, 
like to emphasize again the value I could see this having, having a space, as you say, from these, um, once these new books are published, a space to meet and interact and collaborate with other people that could have tremendous value to um, graduating students who are looking for connections, who are looking for um, other people who are interested in this cause from a place of really personal um, personal passion and um, not so much getting lost in the uh, the corporate, what I, what I would imagine could be the corporate red tape of the traditional trajectory after leaving maybe say college and trying to find their way into this world and getting caught in spaces and places that may not have a lot of movement. So I could see this having having value for that cohort. Stacey, bye. Thanks, Stacey. Bye-bye. Oh, no, um, I'm staying on. I'm just oh, going to okay. listen. Oh, okay. good. Gotcha. Nice. Um, a couple of thoughts on what you just said, Patty. Um, mm -hmm. Gosh, if I remember them, they just were flushing out of my brain. Uh, one is, I love what you said in the chat about, hey, and I'm going to, I'm going to re mirror it back to you differently, but I think, well, which is like looking up instead of looking down. Um, and, and it's really interesting that I've been helping April craft a bunch of speeches and one little nugget that we came up with that I really like that she uses now and then is like, what are your relationship to change and your relationship to the future? And do you see change as like being ahead of you as a thing to be avoided? Or do you see change as being uh, off to the side, you're kind of dodging it? Or do you see change as a hole you're about to fall into or an aspiring vision that you're aiming for upward? And that, that difference between looking down and looking up is really, uh, it, it engages a whole different set of emotions in your attitude toward change, which then predisposes you to see positive or negative things, which then builds and spirals on itself downward or upward. I think that the dynamics of this are really, really interesting. And, and then I agree with you that there's, and, and I'm not young myself, but I think there's a generation of young people trying to figure out how to engage productively, positively to fix some of this crap that they are being handed by the older generations um and 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 then the last thing i wanted to say here was there's a possibility in this neo books project that we could write a book for a particular audience and then we could go into chat gpt or other kinds of mechanisms now and say hey rewrite this book for um, third graders and then we edit that and publish that and, and and that connects into a different set of conversations and a different set of audiences, and we tune it to be a different a different kind of book. But there could easily be a picture book out of this for 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 young kids, uh, and also something more academic for policymakers out of the same thread of ideas, right? That's that's really interesting to me as well. Never mind multilingual translations, which are now far easier than they used to be, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So. Uh, that that's a much bigger vision that would take a lot more infrastructure to do. But if we can crowdsource some of the interest and some of the energy and some of the the time needed to do it, that could really work. and 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 a piece of what informs neobooks is that um, one of my little sort of uh, riffs is that um, books and PDFs are where information goes to die, strangely. Uh, in that, you know, in in Western culture, books are the highest, artifacts of civilization in some weird way like the smartest people in western civilization write books and then those books are supposedly contain their wisdom and then we wrap those books in digital rights management and we proceed to to sort of cut those ideas out of society instead of weaving those ideas into society and the goal of the neo books is to make the wisdom the distilled wisdom extremely useful usable understandable remixable reusable whatever that might be and whatever that turns into. And we don't, we don't have that frame of mind for knowledge. We don't, we don't think of knowledge that way. Uh, and, and the copyright industries are busy overprotecting all knowledge. And that really frustrates me. So how do we still have, how do we still have economic activity and people making a living from doing these kinds of things while letting the ideas run free, unfettered to be used in the right places so we can solve stuff together because otherwise we're hosed. Because the to me the the default destination for the train that we're all bound together on is uh, Doomsville. It's real, we're, we're, you know, if we don't change things pretty dramatically, per Greta Thunberg, uh, if we don't change things really quite dramatically, we're we're not going to do well. Barry, I would love to hear your thoughts after listening in on on uh, our conversation so far. Well, you're into a subject matter that's pretty far afield from anything I have any depth in. 
in terms of the content of the book and also pretty far afield from the notion of writing a book because I've never written a book. I've never thought about writing a book. What I, what I write about is I will put short pieces on the internet open, you know, just put them out there, not trying to make any money off of a paywall or anything. And anything that's longer than that would have been a scholarly paper that I would, would have written 20 years ago. So I'm not in, the, not in the market for writing, you know, books, and I'm not in the market for writing on some, something I know nothing about. But how about as a reader and a person on the planet trying to fix the planet? Well, there, you know the phrase tikkun olam, fix the planet, right? There's an awful lot of dysfunctionality. There's no shortage of dysfunctionality. And the point is, is that the dysfunctionality that I focus on is education. That our young people are just not getting a dis decent education. They're not learning how to think. We don't have enough systems thinkers. We have people who are, um, how to put it, just out in la-la land when it comes to you know, reasoning. And so, and I don't know how to solve that problem either, Jerry. I know the problem. I, I, can, I can characterize the problem just fine. I can define the problem and I can even write on paper a set of solutions, but I have no idea how to get them implemented. I think part of what we're doing in OGM in a very slow, awkward way is experimenting with ways of doing just that. Yeah. And part of it is writing and thinking out loud, whether it's on videos or short posts or a neo book or something like that in ways that other people can pick up and react to respond to remix etc and in the hope that that kind of discourse hasn't died and gone the way of the dodo and i i believe that there's a whole bunch of really smart people out there who are busy doing stuff and also with the full realistic knowledge that there are a bunch of people in the world who are trying to destroy that kind of discourse on purpose because if you can keep people from talking and solving problems, then the world spins downward and then you get your way because authoritarianism looks pretty attractive when things are kind of crappy. Uh, and, and that's really interesting, important and troubling uh, because conversations about sort of, I'm, I'm gonna say facts, although I don't, I don't, I think facts are sometimes pretty dicey. It's like um, intelligent, conversations about the paradoxes involved in finding your way to things you might consider truths or facts uh, are slow and sometimes boring and uh, sometimes pretty detailed. Uh, and that's not like a sexy, attractive thing necessarily all the time. And one of the things in the back of my head is, how do we pull a Jason Silva on this, who does like these shots of awe videos? And I am not the biggest fan of his shots of all videos, but he's got a big following and it's really interesting. And I, I have a whole collection of science explainers from Alan Alda to physics girl, who is suffering from long uh, from a long haul COVID right now, you know, in a really bad, oh, you should go, go look at uh, the videos of her current state. She's in a really bad way. Um, but, uh, and I'm a huge fan of, of the things she was producing. Uh, so, so a piece of this is how do we hack how do we build earworms that get inside people's heads instead of just a rational, sensible tome of a couple chapters of, of book-like thing? But the starting point, the place, the place we want to go to and the place I want to dive into next Monday, and Klaus, if, if uh, I will do the same thing, and anybody, if you think of anybody who wants to write food revolt or something that smells like food revolt built around the ideas that Klaus was just talking about and so forth, invite them into this conversation because we're going to go focused on that. Um, and we, we could use any help that anybody will, uh, would like to offer, but I'm perfectly happy to sit and, and, and do that with you, Klaus. Um, and, I, and I think the more we sort of laser focus on that, the better, because then we'll have this beginning, this irritant that we can drop into the oyster. And uh, from the irritant, other things can start to crystallize and agglomerate and, uh, and riff, and that would be great. I, I look forward to the moment when we can actually riff on uh, a simple, quick first book and start doing things like a children's book or a humorous book or something else. Um, Jerry, do you recognize the name Daniel Quinn? Q-U-I-N-N? Uh-huh. Sounds familiar. Let me check my so brain. Daniel Quinn uh, was a cultural, cultural anthropologist down in some university in Texas. And they had this interesting theory that, by the way, ties into the agrarian culture, the advent of the agrarian culture, 
and he had a whole theory that he wanted to present as an academic theory. Is this and the right for, Daniel Quinn, the author of yep, Story that's of the guy. Ishmael? Right, he wrote the book Ishmael. Now, the interesting thing about Ishmael is he, he wanted to figure out how to present his academic scholarly material to a general audience. Yeah, He spent 20 or 30 years trying to come up with a way to repackage his academic work. And finally, he wrote a Socratic dialogue called Ishmael with two characters, a lowland gorilla and a doofus guy named Alan something or other, so, mm -hmm. I forget. And, and it, it was a hit, it won, I think the Turner Prize. Mm -hmm. And then he wrote a sequel called My Ishmael and a bunch of other. So he spent 20 or 30 years learning how to write fiction, entertaining fiction that en enrobed academic material that was sort of, you know, the, the learning vitamins built into the story. Now he's not the only one. Uh, Raymond Smolian, who was a logician philosopher, also wrote books uh, that had dialogues in them that were fictionalized, a little bit like Galileo did with his um, uh, dialogue on the two chief world systems. That was sort of one of the ones. And of course, the dialogues of Plato, Hofstadter, you know, wanted to get across some really advanced stuff in computer science. And he wrote Gertel Escherbach and a few other things that were aimed at a public audience. And he wrote stories. And, and, and the idea is, how do you take a piece of academic scholarly work and you turn it into a fictive presentation, a story with characters? Mm -hmm. It's a well-crafted story. Now, that's the kind of thing that an academic has no experience in. I mean, how the hell would I take, uh, you know, the theory of emotions and learning and turn it into the story of the theory of emotions and learning where it's just presented as a story. And I go, boy, I'd like to be able to do what Daniel Quinn did and Hofstadter and all these people, Lewis Carroll, here's a guy who's a philosopher logician. And, and they write these fabulous uh, entertaining dramas that become Disney movies and everything. And I go, Umberto Eco said, where have we cannot express a theory? We must narrate a story instead. And they began all the way back with Bible stories. Bible stories and the Greek theater was sort of the beginning of that um, med medium of presenting stories where the very high level abstractions were sort of snuck into the, into the fictional stories, the allegories, the parables, the fairy tales, the fables. And I go, how the hell am I gonna learn to write that? But I can put a, a, a scholarly um, essay or anything into chat GPT and they say, give me an allegory, give me a poem, give me a fable, give me a fairy tale. And it'll generate much of these. Now, whether they're any good, whether anybody would read them, that's another story, but it can do something I, I have never learned to do, which is to write a story. And that's what we have to do. If you want to reach a public audience, you either do something very dramatic like Greta Thunberg, or you find some, some medium for writing digestible stories that you know, can put on Netflix or something that people will actually sit down and their eyes won't glaze over. Or, you, or even better, that they'll tell all their friends to come watch. Exactly, exactly. So, so I'm going to retell a story I've told in a couple OGM contexts. I don't know if anybody from this call has heard me say this, but um, yeah, and, and sorry if you did, but years ago, I remember reading The Da Vinci Code and a few years before that, I had read Leonard Schlein's book, The Alphabet Versus the Goddess. And two thirds of the way through the Da Vinci Code, there's a plot point that apparently was given to him by his wife. Um, and the plot point is about the marginalization of the divine feminine. Um, funny, funny enough, Alphabet and the Goddess has exactly the same thesis, uh, except uh, his starting point, Schlein's starting point, is the advent of linear alphabetic writing. And he, he says, when we got linear writing, it linearized our heads and did really bad things to global cultural stories. And, he, and the, the one that really sticks out to me is he compares pre-alphabet Greece to alphabetized Greece. And he says, in pre-alphabet Greece, you have Diana, goddess of the hunt and major badass world power. And after alphabet, you have Zeus giving birth from his head and his thigh. You have women deprecated. You have, it, it just, it shifts everything. And then I started from, from the word consumer and got to this thesis of, oh my God, we've had a battle between yin and yang, and yang, the male hierarchical paternalistic force, won 
and I, I'm making all this up, I'm borrowing from Taoism, but my thesis was that, wow, we've marginalized the divine feminine and Satanized it. We've basically said, thou shalt not look at all this yin stuff. It's squishy, it's terrible, it doesn't make any sense, it's not rational, nobody should ever think about those things. And it turns out that if you imbalance yin and yang, you fuck up all of civilization and you cause the kind of capitalism that we're living under today. Yeah. And so and so my hope and goal is that we're in a spot where we can rebalance yin and yang. And I see lots of movements around the world that are already doing that, which make me really happy. And at the end of realizing this parallelism between Da Vinci Code, Alphabet and Goddess, and my own little quest, and I haven't published any book either, um, I was like, who had the bigger audience here? Leonard Schlein's book is kind of intellectual. He's not a celebrity. I bet he sold maybe 100,000 copies, maybe more of, of Alphabet versus Goddess. We could look up what the sales were, but not a lot. And Da Vinci Code was a massive bestseller. It was also page turner crime, you know, uh, crime fiction, which means when you're reading it, you're treating everything with a grain of salt, like, ah, this is just a story and just fiction. But those things work their way into your head. And, and so I was very aware that this plot point probably influenced more people being buried inside a page turner that is not, not Faulkner. Um, but that touched more humans than the other versions of the same exact story. So Barry, everything you just said, I'm like, yes, 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 yes. Let's start with an irritant and then let's play with it. Let's sort of go in different directions. And we might need three or four irritants. Like the first one's going to be about food and bioregionalism and soil. And I'm all on board with that. The next one might, might be about something else, about theater and emotions and software. I don't know. Um, but I, I think that, that this ability to rethink and represent the same pieces in ways until we find one that catches um, is important. Yeah, yeah. And that's part of what excites me about this project. Yeah. Did, did you see the name of the rose? The 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 one one or two well, novels that say here's the guy who's a semiotician. That's his discipline. He yeah. writes the name of the rose and a couple of other uh, novels or, or entertainment books. But that's a really rare skill to be in both writing literature and writing academic stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, Umberto Eco. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Foucault's Pendulum, yep. uh, Travels in Hyper-Reality, which I've not read, uh, and a couple others. Sorry, Patty, go ahead. No, you're good. Um, it, it struck me as, as we've been talking about story and um, creating some kind of story that would captivate and um, organically hopefully spread. Um, I'm thinking just the experience I've had as I've been learning more about um, the climate crisis is, and I've heard this from other spaces as well, how a lot of people tend to experience any talk about climate as white noise, right? And we have so many, um, you know, as soon as we hear climate change or global warming, it kind of, um, the experience can be that where we kind of stop, we, we don't necessarily engage in the way that we might once have. And so I'm, I'm wondering how can we tell, and this goes back to what I was sharing earlier, but how can we tell um, a story that cuts through the white noise? And I'm, I'm curious how much of that will might come down to um, just really precision of language and not avoiding language, perhaps that is already really um, commonly used in the way stories about climate crisis are told. That's what came up for me. And uh, Jerry, I was a little unclear. Can you speak to what you mean about irritants? I think I think I missed something. With yeah, yeah. Um, let me come back to irritants in a sec because um, shoot, what, what, sorry, what were you just saying? No, you're good. Uh, just um, telling this story might require um, precision of language and avoiding language yes. that tends to be weaponized. And so, so this is part of the dynamic that fascinates me that I'm worried about that I'm trying to figure out how to stop, which is like the word woke. Right. I was at a call recently, which was about U.S. foreign policy relative to China and uh, the future of, of conflict and all that. And at the beginning of the call, a speaker, basically, one of the points he made was that America's best export may well be wokeism. And I could tell that everybody in the Zoom did like a triple take. And I was like, hmm, ain't that interesting? And I'm a big fan of the word woke, but I was in a, another meeting with some progressive sort of people um, a couple months earlier, where during the weekend conversation, the, the idea of woke came up and the other four people in the room kind of dismissed it like, yeah, woke, man, I'm so tired of woke. And I was like, ah, shit. Okay, so even progressives have dismissed woke because the far right made it such a burning, hot, flamey topic, uh, a stinking pile of whatever, by just piling into it and turning it into a hate fest that the word is now like beaten up. And I think it's, you know, we can take it back, blah, 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 whatever it is. 
but you could go term by term in the world of open source and openness and stuff like that, that happened in the world of organic food and natural food that happened. There was like trade, there was dilution of what it actually meant to be organic in the food system, right? Klaus, you probably witnessed that firsthand as, as uh, organic shows up and then the large entities are like, well, we can't do that. But if we did this and modified the term in this way, we'd be, we could sell millions. It's like, ooh, okay. So you get dilution of the concept, but worse, you get this pollution of the space to talk about important issues. And this is this is a very important strategy of people trying to disable discourse. And trying to sort our way through that is really important, at least to me. Um, and sometimes it means sticking to the term and fighting for its original meaning. So on the call I was moderating where this guy had said, uh, you know, wokeism may be America's best export. I We started talking about China and other stuff and I was like, I noticed that everybody did a triple take um, when when uh, when so and so said this, and I took us into a ten minute description discussion about wokeism. And I said, well, you know, what what woke means to me is being very aware, maybe painfully aware, of suffering that people have had because of how they were born. Right. And you are awake to that and care about it and might actually do something. And the only black person on the call was applauding as I was saying that. And a few other people were sort of nodding and doing jazz hands because I teach everybody jazz hands when I you know, do Zooms. Um, but it was very interesting because we, we needed to spend a little bit of time unpacking that just to get through what the speaker had meant by wokeism may be a, a really significant import, a thought I had never had. So, so, those, are the, the, so those are the dynamics, uh, Klaus, as we sit and just want to talk about, God damn it, if we focus on soil fertility and bioregionalism and uh, regenerative agriculture, things will be better. That is awesome. And I think we can make a, an awesome quick first book that does that. These are the issues that are swirling on the sidelines and, and washing through over the gunnels and threatening to swamp our little craft. Uh, but they're also the energies and, and, and forces that we could harness in some clever ways to go do some good. I'll play with that. I'll tell you an anecdote, Jerry. Uh, about 40 years ago, I was in a relationship with a person who turned out to have borderline personality disorder, but I didn't know that at the time. Ouch. But it was impossible to deal with her. And at one time, it was an encounter. And I don't know what prompted me to do this, but in a command voice, I said, become aware. And I got back a primal scream like you've never heard in your life. Dang. Just a... Uh, ear piercing primal scream came back. And I, to tell you the truth, I, I don't know what that means. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I tell you the anecdote, I don't even know how to interpret it. Klaus, you're about to jump in, but you're muted. You're still muted. Yeah. Uh, okay, right here. Yeah. Uh, the, my my uh, sense is that the uh, there is such a uh, an interest in indigenous learning, you know, and in understanding the indigenous way of thinking, and much of that links to love and respect and admiration for Mother Nature, and much of that, and, and that really is expressed in soil, or it can be expressed in soil because, you know, that the the microbiota in the soil, you know, the famous one teaspoon of soil contains more microbes than there are people on the planet, right? The soil is, the healthy soil is teeming with life. And if we can shape and nurture this life inside the soil, it will take care of everything else around it, right? That's where it originates. So the story of soil um, can be made emotional, it, it, can, it can be the connective tissue we're looking for you know, to solicit uh, an emotional response and, or, or the affectation that as Barry would say it. I think, uh, I, I think that would be a good pathway. And if I may just, uh, uh, Patty, before you go, um, I put in the, the, into the link here, the book, I mean, the written stuff that we have so far, and then a document that says, if you can give me some prompts, you know, of where you think this should go. Um, if you if you have a topic or uh, a short you know, paragraph of what you think is missing in the book, or 
uh, what we should add to it, and I can elaborate on this. And I can do that before next Monday, so we have something uh, more complete to look at. That sounds great. Thank you for explaining the links you put in the chat, Koss. Patty, over to you. Thanks. Um, I might have lost it. I think I just wanted to speak to, um, I've been, Jerry, what you shared about language and language use, I've been tracking um, the relationship between language and I'm calling it power um, for the last about year or so. And um, I have a lot of thoughts around that, but I really appreciate you um, identifying that you think like, yes, this thing, this um, weaponizing of language is, I think, certainly used, you know, by um, uh, by some to to create and um, to create discord and make it difficult to for us to connect and communicate and problem solve. Those weren't your words. That's my language. But I think um, I do appreciate you pointing out that there could be a way to um, use that, not use that to our advantage, right? But maybe in the in the reverse expression, um, find a way to um, organize language or or find a way to to use that in a way that's um, not harmful but regenerative. And um, I think there's I think there's something really big there. I've been that's that's the as I say the beat I've been on for about the last year or so. I have a lot of material around around it. Um, it's not super um, organized yet, but I um, I hope to share it at some point because I do think it could. My hope is that it could help us to uh, have a clearer sense of what is at play underneath language use that may be a little hard to identify that is certainly influencing people as we read and as we experience it and how might we use that to, um, to, to build, to be constructive rather than destructive. So I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, Thanks, Patty, Patty. And I, missed, I missed to make the link uh, to, to uh, what Maya was you know, uh, referring to soil now. It is because so many terms like climate change and so much is weaponized, right? Soil, we can connect to the, to the emotion. Uh, and particularly for what I call the Peter Thunberg generation who are searching you know, for an attachment they're looking for. You know, and so we can make soil, the love of nature, loving mother nature, the indigenous perspectives, uh, use that metaphor you know, to bypass uh, these, these uh, fighting words and, uh, and, and emerge, you know, immerse ourselves into the emotional uh, connection to, to life. Yeah. Um, three things I want to put into the conversation that are quite different one from the other. One is last Thursday on the OGM check-in call, Mark Carranza, completely unbidden, we weren't on this topic at all, but he was like, I hate all this talk about indigenous knowledge. My ancestors, the Maya, were ripping people's hearts out and having sacrifice, holding up people's beating hearts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm like, whoa, this is interesting. And, and during a little bit later in the call, I said, this is a really interesting topic. I'd like to make it the subject of one of our like topic calls on OGM's Thursday call. So uh, I think we might be due for a check-in next week. I, I will go look. But you know, next week or the week after on Thursday, I want to like dive into what do we mean by indigenous knowledge? What are its uses? Why would you object to it? How does this how does this sort of fall for us? So that I think we're going to go there. Second thing is a little bit of language, Patty, around the weaponization of language is the ontological coup. And uh, Obama and others have been talking about we are going through an ontological coup where the far right is sort of, you know, weaponizing words, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's a, a particular way of thinking about it. And then third, totally disjointed thing. Years ago, in a fit of peak, I, I had an idea that I just put up as a website. I wish this would, was, was an actual business. But if you go to placebophone.com, you will find that you, can you, you can't actually purchase these, but I really wish they existed. Uh, a, a wooden phone made from recycled, rescued wood that is exactly the shape and size of a phone. And it's, but it's beautiful and it's soft and it's wood and it's inert and it will never ring and it will not alert you. And you can get that and slip that in your pocket so that you think that you're okay because you still have your phone on and you can walk around. And the thing I just thought right now, and by the way, you could sort of syndicate this out. You could franchise this so that anybody who cares about lumber and carpentry could go start making these things and selling them through a, through a collective website. You could have artists, you know, color them or shape them. There's a whole bunch of really interesting things one can do to sort of manufacture this. So I, I would love, if only I weren't so distractible, I would love to make this into a thing. But now I'm coming back to this thinking, 
is there an artifact like a placebo fund that could contain some health, some soil? And the problem is once you box up healthy soil, it winds up becoming dead soil. So that's a bad idea. But is there some thing that could help? Maybe it's a little micro terrarium, although I'm not fond of these little terraria that are sealed up. You know, we had we were gifted one once and then we dropped it. And that, that felt really terrible. Um, <clears throat> but is there a thing that we could create that would connect people emotionally to soil that they could carry as a token? Um, uh, how does that work? And I just want to plant that seed in case we come back into this and, and sort of think creatively, because that would be really fun to have. And that might be a pathway in, you know, back a long time ago after the Iranian um, uh, embassy kidnappings, tie a yellow ribbon became a meme and a, and a best-selling song. And everybody started tying yellow ribbons around things to indicate, welcome home, we're glad you're back. That's at least what yellow tying a yellow ribbon around the old oak tree meant for a while. Um, memes are not sometimes very complicated. <laughs> sometimes they're really simple. Um, and I think they're important, like we've just been saying, that narratives and fiction and storytelling are important. Because cool. They have a meme that actually people know what it stands for. Yes. If you go back to Twilight Zone equals MC square was this visual meme. Find anybody who knows what E equals MC square really means can really explain it. Good luck. And the memes get co-opted, et cetera, et cetera, as well. So, I mean, another thing that I find really funny, um, what does Antifa stand for? It actually stands for anti-fascism, except the moment you contract it into Antifa, it sounds like a horrible group. And so as long as you just call them Antifa, but if you're against anti-fascism, don't the negatives cancel out? Doesn't that mean you're probably in all likelihood a fascist? It's like, Jesus, but, but, but extremely clever to make Antifa the bogeys. Didn't Woody Guthrie on his guitar have a sentence like, this machine destroys fascism uh, or something like that? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, exactly. It was a sticker on his guitar. Maybe an idea to, I don't know how closely or if this relates to the the idea of the token, but what's coming up for me is the um, kind of bit of like zooming out larger perspective as we consider storytelling and creating meaning that will move, that might move, hopefully move um, people and uh, what's the word help when you mobilize people to um, action or at least concern and relating to that concern. Um, I'm, I'm, I, what comes up for me is this. Uh, suspicion that something that people are looking, this is a generalization, of course, that some many might be looking for is a sense of um, meaning and a sense of identity. And I think that if there is a lack of, um, if if I use myself as an example, if I don't have a clear sense of who I am as a person, I think I become more vulnerable to um, stronger narratives, right? Or more powerful narratives. And so I wonder if there's a place for us to um, not fill that need, right? But but how can we show up to that maybe like empty space? It's not empty space, but that that need with um, constructive means versus destructive needs. Because I think I think that might have sticking power. Again, I don't know how that relates to the token here, but as a theme, a larger theme, that's what's coming up for me. And I completely agree with that and love. That's another force that matters a lot here. And people have a deep desire for affiliation. Um, the traditional forms of affiliation, as Bowling alone told us uh, sort of years ago, but also if you look at religious affiliation in the U.S. now, it's bouncing downward. The largest category is nuns, which means no religious affiliation, but still spiritual. It's it's sort of similar to spiritual, but not religious, which means I believe that there's some kind of higher energy out there, but I'm not going to call it any one of the named religions. That is the largest category growing. Um, and and people in search of some kind of identity, self and group, and these things are very tightly related, will glom onto any freaking thing. And once they've glommed onto it, and this is like, like cult research, it's like, okay, so when the doomsday cultists, when, when, that, when the date of the rapture comes and goes and nobody gets raptured, they double down. They don't really leave. Like more often than not, they're like, nope, nope, nope. We just got the date wrong. There was an error in the math, whatever. We're just going to double down. And then they commit suicide together or, or stupid things like that. It's like this, this set of belief systems is incredibly powerful. And most of the available belief systems are pretty negative. Under which I will unfortunately bundle most of the religious systems. Yeah. Drink the Kool-Aid. There's your meme. Drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> 
Man, that certainly got a whole new meaning. Well, did that meaning come out of Jonestown or did that exist before? That was, I, think it came out, I think I could be wrong, but they adopted the same thing on Wikipedia, that if you bought into the philosophy of Wikipedia, you were drinking the Kool-Aid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That that game, Kool-Aid, came from, because they used Kool-Aid to, to put the poison in. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think it does come straight out of Jonestown, which was 1978. I right. believe that's right. I mean, you can ask. Don't ask Bard. Bard will confabulate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if I, I mean, I, if I may, you know, come back to to this uh, food revolt topic for a moment here. There is another thing that really worries me a lot, and it is that, you know, SD SD energy escalates, and we are really starting to get ready to find a solution. There are a lot of ideas uh, uh, in the queue that are actually really detrimental. So we could actually turn the, turn the corner and say, we are now going for it and we're running into the wrong direction. And there's a lot of that lined up, you know? I mean, so fermented meats and cell, cellular meats is a great example, you know, or uh, uh, carbon capture and, uh, and storage is just complete nonsense uh, in, in, in scale, in cost you know, in feasibility. So, the do not have a clear image in our minds of where we want to, of where we need to go, and of what the destination is holistically, because no one, uh, that, and, and no solution proposed that I have seen includes the socioeconomic components of change, right? And so you can't change the food system unless you change the behavior of millions of people. Right. So, so how do you do that? That means they have to have buy-in. They have to have an emotional connection to why this is happening. So, this is really uh, uh, a deep-seated concern of mine. You now, that uh, we could actually really run ourselves into the ground and just crash it. You know? Absolutely. Uh, and so, Klaus, just to focus us for next week. Um, how much of what you just said fits into the quick first book and in, and where and what and in what way? Because because what you're saying to me is a point of view, and you know that I've been militating for even the quick first book needs to have some sort of point of view so that it's an interesting thing to pick up and maybe read. Um, and and I think we, we, we talk, what you're talking about matters right there. It's, it's like right in that in that neighborhood. And I want to figure out how do we does it or doesn't it fit in the in the outline of the quick first book uh and then what else does and let's let's I i'd love for us to get as quickly as possible to what what the outline looks like and then divvy up what we write figure out how to write it together and get boogieing so that in a in a month or two we can sort of come back and say hey look we have a draft of markdown files here's where they are um, all comments welcome and hey pete uh how do we how do we export this as an epub yeah, well, we have you no. Know, we have some stuff written. Here's the abbreviated yep. version: the story of soil. Um, if you could use this, uh, the the uh, uh, form that I set up there to give to basically uh, give me some ideas, prompts, um, you know, uh, chat, chat GPT type prompts to shape the story. Um, you know, if you could. Do this to 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 kick in some ideas, chapters, um, topics. Then I'll try to incorporate this. You know, and then maybe by next Monday we can divide it up into chapters and and see where we take it from there. But I can spend some time advancing it and trying to make it more story like instead of like one, two, three, four, five. You know, but I, I love that. Also, the quick first book could be very simple and declarative and non-fictiony and like it could just be hey this and this and this that would be fine uh, and at early in this call as you were talking i was sort of spinning on that because i have a bunch of ideas that would fit a simple expository kind of book but still might might be really captivating i don't know uh, but i will offer those up next week um cool and i will go look at your prompts document and see if i can't add them um any last words we're at the end of our time for this call and Barry, thank you very much for joining us. Really appreciate your sticking it through the whole call and uh, jumping in when prompted, even though you're not a neither a writer nor a farmer, uh, nor a lawyer, nor whatever. I'll just point out in case Klaus doesn't know about this Ishmael book, 
that it's all about the advent of the agrarian culture. That's the basic idea. And the, the key thing he wanted to get across is who wrote the first chapter of Genesis? Hmm. And the argument is it was not written by the people who adopted it. It was written by the hunter-gatherers who were the losers. You had the hunter-gatherers and the agrarians. And the first chapter of Genesis is about the advent of the agrarian culture because it's all about create ownership of property and defense of property and all the rules that you have to have for commerce. And he argued that it was the leavers, the hunter-gatherers who wrote those allegories that are in the first two chapters or first chapter. And that was a very interesting thesis. It was an academic thesis, but he wrote Ishmael to introduce that idea. Interesting. You're, you just reminded me, and I just found it in my brain, Barry. Um, there's a book by a different author, but the book is called The Joshua, A Parable for Today. And it was written by a priest named Joseph Gerzon. And it's about a Christ-like figure who appears in some little town in northern New York State and blah, blah, blah. I don't remember that much of the plot. But, but for the personal part of the plot for me was that my aunt, who died years ago, but aunt, uh, Sister Genevieve, a religious sister of mercy, um, was sort of the most religious member of my dad's family and one of the sanest, I think. And she recommended or gave me this book at some point that I was not reading it, not reading it. And then I went on a trip to Sweden and just grabbed it from my bookshelf, which I used to do a lot. Before a trip, I would stand and I would be like, and I wouldn't do it randomly. I'd be like, what feels like the thing to take? So I took this book and then I went and read it along the book and I finished it on a Sunday morning before going to find a Quaker meeting in, um, uh, in Sweden, in Stockholm. And I went to the front desk back, this is pre-Airbnb, so it was a hotel. So I went to the front desk and it took us a long time to figure out that Quakers were Kvakerness uh, in, uh, in the Swedish phone book. But I found out where the meeting was, went to the meeting, met a guy from Philadelphia, an expat who was in the meeting. So we spoke and I speak fluent German. So a quarter of Swedish, I understand. So in Quaker meeting, people stand up during meeting and say messages. And at the end of meeting, I was like, wait a minute, I think I recognized some of what was in the meeting. So I found the Philadelphia guy and I said, can you tell me paraphrase what the messages were about? And he did. And basically it was as if the meeting knew I had finished the book Joshua that morning. <laughs> It, it was really uncanny. And this thing happens now and then in Quaker meeting. It's like something will show up in the messages that is just really active for you in life. And it was as if the, the meeting uh, you know, had known that I, I was reading that book and the messages were about the message of that book. It's really cool. Yeah, the zeitgeist. Um, yeah, totally the zeitgeist. Well, a, very, a very local, very tiny zeitgeist. So a wee zeitgeist. But nonetheless. Uh, thank you all. This is very fun and uh, see whoever wants to show up next uh, next Monday and on on to our weeks. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Thanks, Barry.